So I read a story this week uh, from about six or seven years ago uh, that came from Great Britain. Uh, so pretty, pretty interesting story. They developed a, uh, a polar research vessel, like a boat, uh, more, like, more like a submarine maybe that was supposed to reach uh, the, the, you know, the, the links of the world and, and go into some of the, the harshest conditions uh, in the name of science. Uh, it, it cost about $300 million uh, to develop this vessel, except when they got done spending all that money, they realized they needed to, to name it something. And so uh, they thought, what better way to name something than to give the internet a try uh, to let people speak into what it should be named. So they put an internet poll out. Uh, this is the British government, put an internet poll out uh, to try to help develop the name for this $300 million vessel. And uh, they, they made some suggestions, uh, some things like uh, the Ernest Shackleton after the great explorer, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good solid name for a research vessel, uh, or the Endeavor, uh, that's a good one. And my personal favorite was the Falcon, right? This is like some things they wanted them to name it. They put these out to the internet. But what happened was uh, a journalist proposed a new name on the poll and it gave, it got so much traction, it actually earned 10 times the amount of votes from the internet as the next most popular name. And I, let me just make sure I get this right. It's kind of a technical name. You wanna know what they called it? Uh, the internet voted to name this boat, Bodie McBoatface. Uh, they, I think they achieved their goal, which was like to gain public interest in the project. That, that they achieved, right? Uh, but they did not stick with that name uh, after all. They named it something probably much, much better. Uh, but this proves two points. First is the wisdom of crowds is not always wisdom. <laughs> but God gives us a framework for a wise and a good life uh, that supersedes popular opinion. Like crowdsourcing can help you find a good restaurant, but crowdsourcing isn't a good way to find your way in the world. Uh, so the first thing God does as he establishes covenant with his people Israel, the base of Mount Sinai, is give them a framework for a wise and good life. The way to flourish in the world as the people of God is through this framework called the Ten Commandments. We think of them often as, as rules that put us down, but in reality, it was, as we've heard recently in sermons, that it's a way to give free people who have been freed from slavery a way to stay free, a way to live in their freedom. So, so yeah, I mean, wisdom isn't, uh, isn't always wisdom when it comes from a crowd. Um, the second thing this story of a boat shows us is that names matter. Names matter. Names carry the essence of, of someone or something's identity. Uh, you know, the third commandment as we get to Exodus 20, chapter seven today, or Exodus chapters 20, verse seven today, in the third commandment, we see God emphasizing his name, his name as a path to human flourishing. So this is what we're gonna look at today. A, a command that probably is familiar to you, but maybe in a different way translation that you learned as a child. But let's look today at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Read it with me. It says, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Let me read that again. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Now, I said you may think of this in another way. You probably remember it in a different translation. Maybe as you were growing up, you heard the phrase, thou shalt not. And that's how most people think about the Ten Commandments, that they are just a bunch of thou shalt nots, just a way to put us down and to limit us from the freedom we long for. But instead of just heaping shame or guilt on you today related to this commandment by maybe giving you a list of what not to say or how to tame your tongue or these kind of things, what I would rather do is study the positive side of this command uh, and show us how this command leads us to a life of flourishing. Now, 
the first incredible reality of this command that we can almost just read past is that God gives his people the privilege of identifying with his name. I mean, wow, this is an incredible reality. The all-powerful God who split the Red Sea open, the one who crushes his enemies, the one who revealed himself on a mountain in an incredible display of, of clouds and lightning and thunder, also wanted these people to know him by name. To have the ability to call on him. You know, if God had thundered from Mount Sinai in an audible way, I am the Lord, the people would have been even more terrified. But look at what he says in chapter 20, verse 2. Beginning the Ten Commandments, God does speak up. And he speaks to Moses and he says, I am the Lord. Meaning I'm this all-powerful, sovereign, you know, create, excuse me, God of, of covenant relationship. The God who keeps covenant, right? He's all-powerful. And that's this terrifying reality for sinful people, right? But then he doesn't stop there. He says, I am the Lord, your God. And he uses the name for God that's like the creator God. That he's, he's building rhythms of creation into a way so we can meet him and know him and have a relationship with God. Him. So he says, I am the Lord, which would be a terrifying reality, but he didn't stop there. He continues on by saying, your God. And this is the same way to refer himself as he refers himself to in verse seven. Don't misuse the name of the Lord, your God. So God in his name implies relationship. The transcendent God is never content to be distant from his people but rather he wants to know them and be known by them. And, and God, by giving people his name, gives them the ability to call on him. Our equivalent today is the cell phone. Uh, everybody has a cell phone, and if you don't, you probably have someone's cell phone number, and you can call them or you can text them, you can contact them. When you get someone's contact, you gain access to them. And then that's also a privilege that can be abused or misused as well, right? Right? So the name of God is the bridge between heaven and earth. It's, it's the connection point between eternal, transcendent God, creator God, and sinful humanity. God introduces himself and helps us identify with him by his name. Just a few pages over in Exodus chapter 33, there's a really interesting story. Moses, who we think of as this this great man of God uh, is on the mountain and he's calling on God to see God's glory. I mean, he's had this incredible experience with God on the mountain. He's heard the voice of God and he says, God, I just want to see your glory. Would you allow me to see your glory? And God in his wisdom says to Moses, I actually am not going to let you see my glory because anyone who looks on me who is not perfect like me will surely die. And he wasn't ready for Moses to die. So what he did is he covered Moses over with like uh, cupping his hand over him. And he protected Moses uh, from seeing him as he passed by. But then Exodus 33 says what happened as God passed by is that he says, God himself says his name. And so in God's name is his glory. And he allowed Moses to hear that. Think about how the Bible also talks about God's name. Listen to just a sampling of this. Psalm chapter eight, uh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord, bless his name. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Proverbs 18, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Uh, how about John, uh, who says, whoever gives you a cup, uh, excuse me, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, Mark chapter nine, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name will never lose his reward. Luke 10, the disciples return from mission and say to Jesus, even the demons submit to us in your name. Matthew 6, your name be honored as holy. Matthew 28, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Acts chapter 4, there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Philippians chapter 2, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It seems that the first commandment, if you remember, have no other gods beside me, was, was all about that God stands alone, right? that there is no other God. The second commandment, that you know, we ought not to make idols, was essentially telling us that we can't shrink God down into anything that we can create. But instead, God is carving us into his image again, right? reclaiming his image from what was twisted and tainted by sin. The third commandment, not to take the name of the Lord in vain or not to misuse his name, it is really an extension of this covenant privilege of relationship that we can know the one true God that we can have life with him, that we can relate to him. But it's also implying responsibility. The name of God implies relationship and responsibility. If you go backwards in your text to Exodus 19, we see how God establishes covenant with his people at the base of Mount Sinai. He gives these words to Moses and he says, Uh, That in this covenant, it's not just that he wants to introduce himself to people like, hey, welcome to freedom after Egypt. I'm God. I'm the one who did it. You know, hope y'all, hope y'all be well, be blessed. You know, it wasn't like that. It wasn't just like an introduction. It was establishing, like we talked about last week, a relationship that could be described as patrimony, uh, like a father who gives gentle guidance to his child. It also could be, it could be described like matrimony, right? Like marriage, that how God is a loving spouse. Even when the spouse is unfaithful, God keeps covenant and he maintains covenant, right? So here God is saying that his name implies relationship, but it's also a call into responsibility. Exodus 19 says that there'll be a people of his own possession. There'll be a kingdom of priests. There'll be a holy nation, And so he's conferring to them a role and a responsibility to represent him to the world. Our graduates, some of you ETBU folks even went to graduation yesterday um, for ETBU. Our graduates are conferred degrees, right? Uh, So meaning wherever they go and whatever they do, They have a diploma with the name of an institution and usually a field of study or whatever their accomplishment was that now says something about who they are and what they've been authorized to offer to the world. So they've been conferred a degree. Well, God confers in his name a responsibility to represent him to the world. God is authorizing by his name, his people to offer himself to the world. This is what he's doing. Now, you've heard this probably in church growing up or from a family member or from a friend who might be a believer, not to take the name of the Lord God in vain. And that usually is a response to something someone said, uh, that maybe they you know, used God's name in a promise. And they promised something in God's name that really they probably could not fulfill. Maybe they swore in God's name. And that causes you, you know, like, watch out, lightning's coming, right? Or maybe they, it was just something that was just a casual use of God's name. And you were taught that that's not acceptable. Like, like even in our texting, we probably shouldn't even say OMG, right? Or like if you're a Gen Z in the room, uh, you've probably said on God. <laughs> and maybe if you're not Gen Z, you're not even enough sure what I'm talking about, okay? All these are just casual uses of the name of God. And yes, words matter. And yes, all of these things are prohibited in scripture and we ought to pay attention and we ought to care about the words that come out of our mouth, especially when we invoke the name of God. But the third commandment and the language of the third commandment actually implies something a little bit deeper, a little bit, a little bit more personal to us than just what comes out of our mouths. Uh, our translation says that, it's, that we're not to misuse the name. 
Like you've heard before, we're not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain, but that Hebrew word take or misuse actually means to take up or to carry or to bear. Um, This is like when we unload groceries from the car. I'm not sure if you have similar experiences. You come home and you got the trunk full or the back of the minivan full of groceries and you got to get them into the kitchen. So what we say is that everybody in our family helps move the groceries inside, right? Because we're part of this family, we're going to help carry these bags into the kitchen, right? If you want to eat some of this food, you're going to help take it in from the car to the kitchen. We take them up to carry them in, right? This is what he's saying. We take the groceries from the car to the kitchen, but God's people are given his name to carry into all the world as representatives of him, to show the world what he's really like. So the command isn't simply about the words we speak, that we might accidentally let an expletive fly or use God's name in that way. I mean, yes, that is prohibited, but this command is really primarily about if we identify with his name, we must also identify with his nature. This is part of the responsibility that comes along with the relationship. Identifying with his name leads us to identifying with his nature. This is what God is leading his people to. So the question of the command is not, what did you say that was inappropriate? The question of this command is, how will you be known in the world? How will you be known in the world? We come up with all kinds of ways to be known in the world. You know, uh, one of my favorites is the stickers on the back of vehicles. You pull up to a stoplight and you you see the, whatever sticker they have on the back windshield or on the back bumper of their car. Sometimes it's a slogan or a saying or a a flag or whatever it is. And you're like, okay, you're like, I kind of got that guy pegged, right? But some of my favorites are the ones like the Under Armour sticker. I guess people, like, if you have an Under Armour sticker on the back of your car, like, no offense, but there are people in this world who are so enamored with the brand and what that brand represents that they want that to be their identity. Like, they want people to pull up behind them and they go, that guy must be buff, you know? Like, he must work out or, or that guy must be good at sports or whatever. I guess whatever that sticker represents, that's the identity that they want to carry, Right. Uh, one of my other favorite ones, just to pick on people, is salt life. Uh, you know, we live like a minimum of four hours from the ocean, but you see people all over Marshall with a sticker that says salt life. And I guess it's like, hey, I've been to the beach. And uh, that, I guess that's what they want to be known for. Like, that's, that's it. That's what they want to carry. That's sort of the kind of thing we do to be known in the world. We take up things like stickers and that go everywhere with us on our vehicles to be a witness to how we want to be known. The covenant God established with the Israelites, it called them to stand out in the world, to be like a sore thumb, right? To be a people of his own possession, to be a kingdom of priests, to be a holy nation. In other words, to take up his name meant that they were to show the world what God was really like, meaning that he would be the only one, the only name, the only brand that they were known for. That's the call of the third commandment. The New Testament illustrates this incredibly well in the book of Acts, chapter 11. If you look at verse 26 in chapter 11, if you're turning there and navigating there on your phone, there's a little phrase that says, this is the first place that they were called Christians. Let me give you a little background. At this point in the New Testament, followers of Jesus were known mostly among themselves as people of the way. I mean, that's kind of how they would refer to it. We're people of the way. It's like Jesus said in, Ch- in John that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we know if we don't live in his way, we also forsake his truth and we lose out on the life, right? So living in his way is really important. So they said we're people of the way. But as the good news of Jesus spread and lives continue to be changed, another name was given to these people, first to the believers in Antioch. And it's a name that stuck even to today, Christian. The lives of believers in Jesus, followers of the way, were so strikingly different from others, from the non-believers, that the non-believers started calling them what they thought was an insult. Look at those people. Who do they think they are? Christians, which literally means little 
Christs. Think about that. Even though they meant it to be derogatory, it perfectly captured the essence of belief in Jesus. That to be a Christian literally means not just to identify with the name of Jesus, but to identify with the nature of Jesus in a way that it becomes the one thing we're known for. So you start to see how the third commandment is, I mean, yeah, it is about the words we speak, but it's about something so much more. It's about how we're known in the world and who we are making known in the world. So do you want to gauge how well you're doing with the third commandment? Try this. Think about your life if you didn't have a name. If your parents didn't give you a name, if you were just a person in in existence, and the people around you had to name you based on your way of life, would the name Jesus be part of their consideration? Would the name Christ, Messiah, come into their brainstorming? Is your way of life lead people to know not just who you are, but who Jesus is? Because that is bearing the name of God well. And that's what God was leading people to. You want to live a life that's flourishing in this world? Not just identify with my name, which is an incredible privilege, but also learn to identify with my nature so that you can accurately represent me to the world. And that is where you will find the most freedom, the most joy, the most goodness, the most happiness, the most blessing in representing him well. Now, conversely, how do you know if you're breaking the third commandment? If you don't, if you identify as a Christian, If you say, yes, I'm a Christian, you check that box on the census or whatever it looks like. If you say, yes, I'm a Christian, but your life doesn't reflect Jesus in all things, you're breaking the third commandment. That's how we bear the name of God in a way that's vain. If the name of God doesn't transform us into the nature of God, we're carrying it in a way that's vain. In other words, it's empty or it's meaningless. It hasn't taken effect It hasn't done the job that it was supposed to do. Kevin DeYoung says this means that we are not to bear God's name in a manner that's wicked, worthless, or for wrong purposes. Which, yes, includes all of our speech and, you know, making promises we can't keep and swearing in God's name. All those things, the OMGs, the on gods, all of that. He says also that taking the, bearing the name of, of God in a way that is vain is taking up the name of God in service of what is false, frivolous, or phony. This guy's a good preacher. He can alliterate, right? That's actually masterful alliteration because phony starts with a P. <laughs> I'm not on that level yet. Taking up, bearing God's name in a manner that's wicked, worthless, or for wrong purposes in service of what's false, frivolous, or phony, that's breaking the third commandment. And the gravity of this is displayed in the warning at the end of verse 7. Because it's not just a thou shalt not. It's also a, a why. Because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. I mean, there's a heaviness to that. There's maybe even a little fear in that. Um, Speaking of words, I learned a lot of cuss words from my brother. It's just how things work, right? He's an older brother, three years older than me. When I was in middle school, he was in high school. And so, uh, you know, kids come home with words that you don't intend on them to say. And uh, and I had picked up on a lot of those in in public schools. So had he. He taught me a lot of them. Um, but then in, when he was in high school, he and his buddies had like a spiritual awakening of sorts, and uh, they decided that they weren't going to cuss anymore, that that wasn't, that wasn't the way they should live. And uh, they created this system of what I'll put in air quotes, accountability, uh, which was that if one of them let a curse word slip, the other two got to punch that one for free, a free punch. 
uh, with no recourse, right? That was their accountability. Well, totally unaware of this arrangement, my brother and I are walking uh, in our neighborhood one day, and what do you know? I let a curse word fly, and he socked me. And I was just like, well, I let another one fly. And so he punched me again, and I'm like, quickly, I'm kind of figuring this thing out. It's like Pavlov, right? I mean, okay, if I do this, then that happens, right? So I, I stopped saying the cuss words, and in theory, that should have taught me the lesson that I was supposed to learn, except what I learned wasn't how to stop cussing. It was how to stop cussing around certain people and in certain situations. Now, one of the ways that we wrongly think about the Ten Commandments is we think that if we can just rein in our behavior, that if we could just do better, especially around the right groups of people, that we will avoid punishment. But that's not true. God says that anyone who misuses his name ever, he will not leave unpunished. Now, what do we do with that? Well, the reality is the third commandment is about so much more than just controlling the words that come out of our mouths. Now we see God's design is for our life to flourish. We must take up his name and therefore also his nature. That there's something deep in us that's changing, that's transforming, that we're becoming less like our sinful selves and more like our Savior Jesus as we take up his name. But the truth is we will never be able to accomplish that on our own effort. We can never modify our behavior enough to become acceptable to God to avoid the punishment that he warns about here in Exodus 20, chapter 7. It's chapter 20, verse 7. Our, our effort at best is behavior modification. We need something more powerful than ourselves to escape this punishment. So here's the good news. We can take up the name and the nature of God because Jesus took up our nature. Listen to what Philippians chapter two has to say about this, verse five. And I want you to see it on the screen with me. Paul exhorts us to adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had become a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him, and check this out, gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we can only, our only hope in taking up the name of God and thereby the nature of God is in Jesus who took on our nature and lived perfectly, never sinning, never falling short, so that he could offer his life as an acceptable, sacrificial substitute for us, dying on the cross the death that we deserved, taking on the punishment that we earned having the perfect name of God and, and holding it perfectly, he took on the punishment that those of us who misused the name of the God had earned. And he bore it for us. He carried it. Isaiah chapter 53 gives us this great picture of this. He bore our iniquities. He carried our sins so that now we can freely carry his name. This is the beauty, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world tells you to make a name for yourself. The world tells you you can decide the best way 
to live. But God says, there's a name above every name. A name that at one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And so we see the only way that we can have the privilege of bearing his name and being transformed into his nature is by bowing in faith at the feet of Jesus. This is how we come into right relationship with God. This is how we experience freedom from sin. Just like the Israelites, God freed them from slavery. Jesus frees us from the slavery of sin to live a life of flourishing by taking up his name and living into his nature because he took our nature in order to give it his name. This is the incredible reality that we can understand today. So the question is, have you bowed in faith to the name of Jesus? Have you laid down the crown of being king of your own life and submitted to Jesus as the king forever? If not, today you can make that decision. You can lay down your own effort, your own striving, your own shortcomings, your inability to achieve perfection, and you can pick up what Jesus did for you, which is his death on the cross and his resurrection, the offer of eternal life, knowing God and being known by him, freedom and flourishing forever. And the only way to pick it up is by faith. You can't earn it. The Bible says in Romans 6, it's a free gift, the gift of eternal life that you can accept today. Would you bow your head in prayer with me? Lord, I pray that each of us in the room today would know you by faith, that we would have the courage to walk away from our own effort and that we would submit to the work that Jesus did for us and on our behalf on the cross so that we could know and be called truly Christian to identify with your name, the name that's above every name and that Lord, by your grace, you might transform us into your nature to become more like Jesus, to reflect your glory. Lord, for those of us who have been carrying the name of Jesus, maybe for some, quite some time, but have not been transformed fully into your nature, would you continue to refine us, to shape us, to carve us, to chisel away what's unnecessary, to reveal how you intended us to live and to be. We give you that, uh, that authority today. God, help us learn to be people who not just are in control of our tongue, but are submitted to your way of life. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.